Welcome. Good afternoon. Hello. Hi, I'm Joel Achenbach with The Washington Post. It's great to be back here uh, at the Aspen Institute for this amazing event. Thank you, Aspen Institute. Thank you, Thank you Jamie, Walter, Peter, everyone who made this possible. Uh, I'm here with Gary Radke, uh, eminent professor from uh, Syracuse University, author of textbooks on art history, and Marco Chianchi of uh, the Florence uh, um, uh, Fine Arts uh, the uh, Academy of Aca Fine Arts. Academy of Fine Arts in Florence. And we're here today to talk about the, uh, the, the painting, The Battle of Anghiari. Who here has heard of either the painting of The Battle of Anghiari or The Battle of Anghiari itself? Who's, who's, oh, so we, you're all graduate students. Uh, Everyone, they know <laughs> all right. Oh my, it's a very educated. Judy, I, okay, Judy. I'll just tell you, I had not heard, heard of that. Judy, um, you, you know, the painting. <laughs> Here's, here's the buzzkill right out, out of the gates. It has been lost, okay? Uh, it, it, it was unfinished, it was damaged, abandoned, and lost, otherwise a masterpiece, <laughs> right? Uh, so let's start, uh, Gary and Marco. What we have here, you see on the screen, is uh, a very good image of, uh, by uh, a painting by Peter Paul Rubens, based on the Leonardo. Tell us what we're looking at and why was this such a big deal painting? Who asked Leonardo to paint this? Where was this in his life when he uh, painted his version of this? Sure. The Battle of Anghiari was going to be an enormous fresco in the City Hall of Florence. What we have today are just little sketches and then this relatively large uh, drawing that shows us what is the center of what that composition might have been. We frequently call this particular image, I'm pointing down here, but you're looking over yeah. there, uh, the battle for the standard, because there was in the midst of this uh, battle a great heroic moment when the Florentine forces were able to uh, conquer and ca capture the standards, the flags of their opponents the Milanese. Now, so, so, so Florence in Milan, that was like Ohio State, Michigan, that was like a really big thing. It was Italy. a big deal. And okay. it, I mean, Florence and, and Milan had been sometimes very often rivals. From 1450 on, uh, they had become, there was a, a greater peace between the two cities. I think it's fascinating that they, the city government asked Leonardo, just coming back from Milan after the Sforza <laughs> government has <laughs> uh, collapsed, We'd like you to do a battle scene where the Florentines beat the Milanese. Uh, I so, mean, so Marco, a, tell us about no, this moment no, in time, the no, politics well, and this. No, the thing is that uh, this battle was won against the Visconti. Right. <laughs> so that's the important thing. That was the enemies of the sports, after all. Right. But anyhow, uh, what should I say? This is uh, 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 like a, a ghost painting. A ghost because painting. a ghost painting, because uh, nobody knows uh, if the painting is still there. We oh. know that uh, Leonardo began it, his work. We know that he also abandoned the work, uh, most probably for technical problems that he was having, because he would typically use, you know, uh, a way of painting that was not the buon fresco. It was actually a way that, uh, you know, replicated the, the old painting on panel, and it didn't work. So <laughs> here's the thing about this painting. It's lost, but it may still exist, we and we're going to get to may. that. So right. uh, and, uh, let me just ask both of you, do you think this painting is behind the Vasari painting? Let's, first of all, let's give you an image right here of, this is a reconstruction. I don't know if you can see this. It's pretty pixelated, probably. It's pretty pixelated. Of, of, of the scale of the painting, all the different figures involved. If you go back to look at the, at the Rubens, which was painted a, a century later, uh, this is just a detail. Uh, mm. This th is the wrong date. Huh? Okay. No, so, because uh, the date uh, is uh, 1503 on Rubens, and in fact, it's 1603. Okay. Well, no, 1503 was when the ah, Leonardo okay, okay, idea okay, okay, was okay. there, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so tell us what this uh, image shows here. It would have shown all the different parts of the battle. Leonardo 
writes in his notes about what is battle really like. He describes, in fact, the smells, the sounds of battle, the smoke, the dirt, the screams. It was almost, I think he was imagining it as actually being immersed in that uh, battle where there were horsemen, there were men with pickaxes who were going after one another. It was an extremely violent and uh, extremely, in the end, successful battle for the Florence. So today, he would be a, a, a multimillionaire Hollywood movie maker. Indeed. Right with with the big budget movies with all the the violence and all that. So let's look at. Um these details. What are we looking at here? Well, what we're lucky is that in Budapest and in many other collections as well, there are some spectacular drawings of details that show us uh, what looks like the rather caricatured face in, in the Rubens copy at the center of the of the of the the image. Uh, how Leonardo would have had the warriors actually screaming at one another. There's something that we've been talking about, about this inner energy, about the psychology that is expressed through the body that is at once explained by, we can hear uh, him shouting, we can hear the opponent on the right uh, doing the same in yet a different tone. So what's happening with this gentleman on the left here? Is he's in the middle of battle? He's angry? What, what's happening? There? He's the one that's in, in the, the drawing that's beneath it at the very center who's got his um, a sword up and is probably trying to uh, uh, certainly uh, mortally wound uh, mm -hmm. the oppo opponent who's coming by him on horseback. That's Let's, the Florentine and that's the Tolentino, right, the, right. the head of the Milanese. So let's 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 look. So this yeah. is uh, the the scene of the painting. What are we looking at here? Well, this is the room where we know the painting uh, was begun. Uh, it's the uh, Great Council Hall. Uh, it has been enlarged. Vasari in the second half of the 16th century raised the roof and then uh, changed the, the oh, imagery. Basically. But both uh, Leonardo and this young man, 23 year, young, years younger, uh, Michelangelo, were asked to do uh, battle paintings uh, in this room. Uh, both of them started, neither of them finished. So, so you can go in this place no, today. I would like, to, I would like to, to make a notation. That ceiling uh, has been the scene of uh, a famous uh, Dan Brown uh, <laughs> book. It's when they break through. <laughs> when uh, they break through and somebody get killed. So in other words, I'm introducing now a very interesting topic. The way the Italian Renaissance uh, is represented or misrepresented. Misrepresented, probably. Yes. So that's well, a very true. So I want to say that Dan Brown has got a special award from the city of Florence, <laughs> just in that room, because he has advertised the city so much, so good, with his two books, with the Da Vinci Code first, and then Inferno. So he has made a great service to the city of Florence, though many of the Florentines after having read the book, they, they shook their head, their head, <laughs> because they say, what in the hell? What is this? I mean, uh, this is fiction. And as a matter of fact, it's fiction also about uh, the Da Vinci Code. You read it, uh, and uh, if you know enough about Leonardo, you find it's at least strange. Yeah. <laughs> so, so in this room is a Vasari painting right. that is painted where we, we think the Leonardo was. Uh, tell us, I mean, is it possible that Leonardo, as many people have alleged, but this is a huge controversy, is it possible that Leonardo is behind the Vasari painting? Perhaps, let's look at the next slide a second Correct. so we can Correct. get a sense. Good. Uh, this is a reconstruction of what the room may have looked like, or at least part of the room before uh, Leonardo uh, went uh, working on it. Uh, and uh, we know that there is a description of the room, uh, we've got it right here, uh, in which we can place where the painting was located. If you look at the, at the east wall, you'll see that in the center there was a loggia of the signori. They were the head uh, officials of the government. On the left-hand side, is, as we look at the gonfalonieri di compagnia, and on the right-hand side, the dodici buonomini, or otherwise known as the 12 good men. And we have a little uh, description here, written in the early 16th century, that tells us that Leonardo's painting was in that position 
and that's where one of these Bizarre paintings is. I'm going to read it in English, and because I'm the American, I'm doing that, and then Marco is going to read it in Tuscan, so you can you know, yeah, hear pure what Florentine. it really sounds <laughs> like. At this time, Leonardo da Vinci, a very great and Florentine master of painting, began to paint the Hall of the, of the Council on that wall over where the 12 good men are. And that hallway from the palace to the hall was caused to be paved with nearly brown, round bricks and nine flags taken from Lord Bartolomeo d'Alviano a few days ago were hung in that said hall. Now that you okay. know what that means, <laughs> you find no Now point. that you know what that means, you can hear, oh, wait a second, I need my eyeglasses. Okay, this is actually, uh, uh, a memoir uh, written by uh, Cerretani. There's a Cerretani street uh, that goes from the Duomo to the railroad station in Florence. And it was written apparently in the summer of 1504. Right. And uh, it says in uh, 16th century Florentine, in, te, in questo tempo, Leonardo da Vinci, maestro grandissimo e fiorentino di pittura, cominciò a dipingere la sala del consiglio, in quella faccia sopra dove stanno i dodici bonomini, e fessi a mattonare quell'andito del palazzo in sala con mattoni quasi tondi, e a piccossi in sala detta nove bandiere tolte al signore Bartolomeo d'Alviano più giorni fa. The that's reason, the way that's, it that's, sounds. That's, that's, this was written <laughs> when? When was this written? Around, right about when, when Leonardo began to uh, work on, on, on his painting. We know that uh, in the later 16th century, uh, well, first of all, we know that something got started there. And Leonardo was painting in a very unusual medium. Leonardo was always inventing, whether it had tar, whether it had pitch, whether it had wax, it had something in it that wasn't drying correctly. So Leonardo had this bright idea, let's light some fires on the lower part of the wall and warm up the wall. And then he burned the whole place down. <laughs> Almost. The, the, the painting actually melted the, the, down the wall. And that's why we, when you ask the question, does it still exist? Well. If it does still exist behind another wall that was built in front of it for the Vasari painting, it cannot be in very good condition. It cannot be a, a painting that's going to look like what I, we think a painting should look like. I would like. like to add a little thing. Me, uh, Leonardo himself writes a note in Madrid too, if I remember right, where he describes the terrible weather conditions at the time when he put for the first time his uh, paintbrush uh, on a wall. A big storm uh, happened. I mean, the, the water jar broke. Right. The cartoon uh, tore into pieces. And uh, you know, all of, the, all of the, I believe that the bells uh, that called the, the council started to, to ring. So something uh, terrible, I mean, a terrible omen happened, and this is uh, a memory of Leonardo that he wrote uh, about this uh, painting when he started it. Uh, so it wasn't born under a good sign. Yeah. All right, so there was fire, <laughs> there was rain. Um, fire and rain. Fire right. Right. So let's ask a dumb question. I mean, did Leonardo understand that we, we 500 years later, w want his paintings to have survived? Does he understand that he was like a great painter and that he should paint in a way so that the stuff would last and not melt, that he should maybe try to finish some of these no. things? I mean, did, did, he, did he realize that he was living in the Renaissance? Uh. Did, he, did he know all that? Well, I do, I mean, when you think of how many thousands of pages of notes and notebooks survive, I think we've got a good sense that he did want uh, and need to have his legacy uh, treasured and, and, and continued. Uh, he just wanted to make everything perfect, right? And so uh, he, had he succeeded, this painting would have been like a glorious oil painting on, on the wall. It would have had something that most fresco artists had never, most until the, maybe the 17th century, had never been able to affect, and that is atmosphere, light, 
color rather than it being uh, a, a generally flat tonality as typical fresco had been. Mm -hmm. Should we look at what's on the wall now? Sure. Okay, so this is the Vasari. Right, right. Go ahead. And this is where Marco and I are going to part some company because I'm going to play the role of the good American, that's all of us, <laughs> and he's going to play the role of the good Florentine. Florentine. Uh, more Florentine than Italian. Oh, okay. Remember and that in Italy we have all of those differences. A big difference. <laughs> What's fascinating is uh, over the last couple of decades, uh, scholars and scientists have uh, begun to think about, well, where could this, could this painting survive? Uh, and this is a big battle scene that was painted in front of the Leonardo. And scientific tests and scanning and uh, various uh, uh, tests have shown that there is a brick wall, a thin brick wall that Vasari erected in front of the wall on which uh, Leonardo must have painted. So clearly, if something does survive, there's pro there, there may well be something behind it. There, in fact, uh, recent tests have shown they put in probes and cameras, and there is a gap. There's actually a gap between the original wall and this wall. And this large painting is then painted over it. And what people have fa found fascinating, but that Marco will provide a uh, response to is, there's this wonderful green flag that I've circled uh, there that we got a detail of, and it says on that flag, cerca trova, which in Italian can be loosely translated as, seek and ye shall find. Now, Marco has a different interpretation, though. <laughs> no. Okay, so here we go. No, this is gonna be fun, because you see, to most of the Florentines, uh, this sounds like uh, a treasure hunt. Cerca trova. Mm -hmm. It sounds strange to many. So two scholars, uh, philologists, not art historians. So in other words, serious people. <laughs> <laughs> serious people that read the text, that they don't have uh, a bias uh, because they want to find. So they have studied. Uh, uh, the concept of, the, the, the name of the two scholars is uh, Mushi and uh, Savorelli, if you want to know it. Actually, you can find a note also in Wikipedia, <laughs> at least uh, the Italian version of it. I don't know about the American, uh, I don't know about the English. But anyhow, here it says uh, that uh, these two scholars, uh, they wanted to reconstruct uh, the theme uh, of the fortune of uh, fortune and damnatio, damnatio is uh, condemned, of, uh, of the oldest Florentine insignia, libertas, liberty. So in other words, uh, of course, Cosimo was, uh, after all, a tyrant, uh, and Who's he had the been patron the of killer of the Florentine Republic, and Michelangelo, stood uh, on the side of the Republic against uh, Cosimo. Let's not forget it, though later on things uh, became uh, differently you know, uh, regulated. But the point is that uh, Cosimo, he wanted, to, you know, he wanted to deface all of the ideas of liberty, which is a Republican concept. Right. So according to the scholars, uh, they, this cerca trova, it's something that uh, was uh, written in the battle, in the real battle, was written on eight green. It specified the green flags that the king of France had given to the Fuoriusciti Fiorentini, I mean to the Florentine rebels, those who were against Cosimo. And so the conclusion is, cerca trova, actually, it wasn't written cerca trova, it was written something longer and uh, much more important. One of uh, Dante's rhyme, you know, Dante Alighieri for us is the top of everything. Sometimes they ask me, who's the most important artist that you ever had? I always say Dante. Yeah. I say, but Leonardo, Michelangelo, Dante. Dante is above all. 
Yeah. Even in the mind of uh, Leonardo and Michelangelo. That's Take next summer. Like, yeah, but well, let me conclude. Here. Let me let me finish this because this is interesting. So, on the flags, uh, on the green flags, was written "Libertà va cercando che si cara come chi per lei vita rifiuta," seeking for liberty which is so dear to those who refuse it. Uh, who, 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 I mean, who, wait a moment, because my translation, uh, echo, who's uh, so dear to those who refuse it, losing their lives. So this was uh, the insignia on the, grand, on the green flags. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the memory of, but wait a second, wait a second. So right. why is it Cerca Trova then? Cerca trova, according to the scholars, is a way of mocking the for you shitty. Saying that, cerca trova, you seek and you will find us. So, so, so that's the idea. That so in, other words, saying... in other words, the conclusion could be, this is again an hypothesis, but it's, uh, you know, it's based on, uh, on, uh, on uh, writings, uh, uh, the, the hypothesis that this was not written by Vasari to say that uh, they should decide. look there. Right. It's written because it's part uh, of, uh, you know, of the battle scene, and it's a way of mocking those who were against Cosimo. But How do you Marco, like it? But Marco, who cares <laughs> if it's really Cerca Trova, whether it's from Dante or whether it's from this? There is likely to be some kind of painting behind this painting. So why will you as a Florentine not think it's a great idea for, with advanced technology, no, 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 to not pull that. this Vasari no, no, out no, of no. the way no, no, no. and see whether we can no, no. find it? I'm can, not can saying Can you that. just peel up the Vasari painting and no. no. look behind? It doesn't work that no, way? No, no, that, that's a, what do you, how do you, how do you move? You are kidding me. No, what? no, no, you cannot do that. I'll, I'll, listen, I want to tell you something about this thing. Uh, uh, personally, I'm not against I remember that Cristina Cidini, dear friend of mine, the superintendente until not long ago, she wasn't very much against it. The Opificio delle Pietre Dure, which is the maximum institution for restoration in Florence, Italy, and one of the most important around the world, I'm sure that uh, all of the scholars refer to the Opificio delle Pietre Dure, which since uh, the flood of 1966 is an authority in restoration, they sent uh, one of their men to work on the scaffoldings uh, together with Seracini. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they has not been unwilling. But listen up, there was a political issue. Uh, there was a political issue that I can represent if you want. Sure, yeah. Uh, Just the to be political, clear, so well, the, the, the no, Saracini but, drilled some holes for the painting a few uh, years ago, right? Thing, Only in places where there were already losses uh, look, in the okay, paint, and okay. it was relatively safe to do uh, it. Seracini, the year 1975, following uh, Carlo Pedretti's, uh, you know, intuition, parenthesis, I would like uh, to pay a tribute here to the doyen of the uh, Da Vinci scholars, uh, Carlo Pedretti, who's almost 90 years old now, and he lives in Vinci and he's ready to open his own, uh, the, uh, his own Pedretti Foundation in Vinci. And he has been you know, my mentor, of course. Uh, so I am very grateful to Carlo for everything. By the way, Carlo had this intuition. Seracini was young at that time. He has uh, pursued this uh, idea till he has been able to find uh, funds, uh, National Geographic, right. and has been able to find uh, the political backup. When this happened, I would say it has to do, in Italy, we don't fear speaking about politics. Mm -hmm. We are very much outspoken. So I will tell you, there's a name around many things revolve. The name is Matteo Renzi. Yes. The Matteo mayor. Renzi is <laughs> a guy 25 years older than I am, 
actually one younger. day. Younger, he's much younger than you are. Renzi, is, you said he was older. Older? Uh, no, no, younger. No, he's 41, 42. Actually, his father is my age. And one day, Matteo, that I know pretty well, Matteo, one day he wrote something, oh, my father did something wrong, but you know, at his age. So I sent him a message, just saying, well, what are you saying here? Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Matteo Renzi, who's a very strong character, mm -hmm. he, he, has, a, he has Italy, escalated, escalated the Italian politics in a few years. So, so does the mayor think, and do you think, Marco, and Gary, do you think that the Leonardo, the lost Leonardo, is behind that painting? Or something I'm not sure. Nobody's sure. That? You think it's Nobody's damaged sure. if it's there? I, 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 I think, think there's so. good reason to think that there is something behind there. And there are reports, even after the painting was uh, uh, ruinous, that the, there were people were being encouraged to go to the Palazzo Vecchio and look and see what remains of the Leonardo, 15, so there 49. was something yeah. there. So I it, do believe that. No, I, no, I also be, I believe maybe if you, if you would be able to retrieve, which I believe uh, is going to be difficult, mm. because how do you remove the Vasari thing? I mean, to many Italians, uh, that would be a crime. But to other people, <laughs> right. I mean, Vasari no, is one of those those artists who painted by the acre, and these paintings I were, know, were I not know. painted. To right. their, it is not the single. No, wait a second. Uh, wait a second. The, 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 the Vasari partisans are in revolt. They're upset. Um, right. uh, so before we go on here, also painting in the hall, yeah. well, and there's a whole session about this tomorrow. Um, uh, not exactly side by side, but there was a competition between Leonardo and Michelangelo. Right. I mean, who knew that they, that they had, they were both painting in the same room, huge battle scenes. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's like in comic books, it's like the Hulk versus Thor, you know? Right. Like, I mean, it's a big deal to have these. Did, sure. So what happened there? Well, what happened there was that Leonardo initially got the commission. Then Michelangelo, a year later, is brought in to do some more walls. And we don't know whether they were going to be next to each other or opposite one another. That's, again, <laughs> That's one of these thing. great unknowns. Uh, but what's so fascinating to us is that the two of them had such different approaches, that Leonardo's was going to be this great cinematic and uh, full of, of energy. And at least the parts that remain of the Michelangelo idea uh, are largely, typically Michelangelo, based on the human figure, on nudes, on figures that are in complicated poses. So we would have had the two alternatives, really, the Michelangelo on one side and the, the Leonardo on the other. See, but the Michelangelo never became a painting, not even the beginning of it. It just remained a cartoon. Just a cartoon. Just a cartoon. So, so no, so Leonardo da Vinci, he began, <laughs> maybe he did something. But I, what I believe, I, I'm not against you know, trying, uh, exploring. I'm not against that uh, in theory. Then if you want, we can come to, other, to, to another part of the debate, the political part, uh, but because that's the most important thing of all, in my opinion. By the way, if, you, if you'd be able to find something behind it, they would have probably abstain. Mm -hmm. I don't know, something like that. You, we don't know, but we don't know. We exactly. don't know, but we, we, we all love The Last Supper, Marco. We, we, we're willing to look at a painting that has three flakes of color here and four flakes of, 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 of color there. Because I think that the, the beauty of the, of, the, of the Last Supper, like the beauty of the Battle of Anghiari mm -hmm. composition, is that Leonardo is able to do what we've been talking about, both the macro and the micro. Mm -hmm. That his overall compositions are always so strong and so well thought out that even if we're missing the details, or if he's decided I'm just not going to get to those <clears throat> details, there is something to see. Um, before we go on to the military right. stuff, which, which is next, just head to head, Leonardo Michelangelo. I, someone here last night was saying, and I don't want to say who it was, okay, it was Walter, was said uh, <laughs> that Le Leonardo was a much better painter. Do you agree that, that, than Michelangelo? Is that true? 
Let Mario they continue. were different. I yeah, learned yeah, this okay. from the Americans. <laughs> when the Americans do not want to say something, they say, it's different. It is different. I learned that from the Americans. Uh, well, <laughs> I did, I, I, your question is really an interesting one, because uh, we like to sort of say, uh, is, is this better than that? It's and in impossible. terms of what we now think of as painting, that painting is richly colored, that it's tonal, that it is atmospheric, that it has uh, a, a great sense of, of depth, Leonardo clearly superior to, to Michelangelo. Michelangelo is a fresco artist uh, for the most part. He's a sculptor who wants his paintings to look sculptural. <laughs> but uh, would we ask, uh, is uh, Michelangelo a better sculptor than Leonardo? Uh, I'm going to have a session about that, and I'll tell you, no, they're both really great. They're both really great. Yeah, they're, they're both pretty talented fellas. Um, okay. okay, so let's talk for a second. Um, I'm going to, there's a, a quote, Marco, uh, it's in Walter's book. Uh, uh, that he quotes you saying, man is a machine, a bird is a machine, the whole universe is a machine. Uh, Leonardo was fascinated with, with machines, and among the things that he liked to do was design military contraptions uh, that, like this giant crossbow. Uh, what, what was that about? Because here's a, you know, veg, as Walter points out, a vegetarian, a, you know, a peace-loving <laughs> guy, and he gets, he's running <laughs> off and, 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 and tell, telling the no, Duke you, of Milan. You want to know something? When we read uh, uh, Leonardo's notebooks, we find uh, a statement that maybe is very good, very clear, and we use it all the time to characterize the person. But if you read the, all of the manuscripts, most probably you will find another sentence which says just the opposite. Just, okay. So this must be clear. You know, Leonardo da Vinci manuscripts, they can, pull, they can be pulled one side or another side. That's the way it has always been with Leonardo. And then he becomes mysterious uh, because it's unclear, because uh, that kind of things. But you know, Leonardo, uh, I have seen uh, on a screen, uh, uh, the, 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 the letter, the, 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 the application letter that he sends uh, to, the, to the Duke of Milan. And uh, there's a list uh, of uh, military, you know, things, uh, weaponry, uh, you know, whatever else, uh, fortresses, bridges, right. uh, that he can do or destroy and everything else. Yeah. But, you know, most probably, but you know, I don't think that Leonardo at the age of 30, when he wrote that letter, he knew much about the war. But he never, never seen the war. So it, it, this was made probably to impress the Duke. And everything that uh, he draws, like those fantastic, uh, you know, out of scale machines, they are to impress uh, the Duke and also you know, almost for fun. I mean, uh, machines like those could never be used. But Most many problem. of them are sort of based in uh, Valturios and other kinds absolutely, of, uh, absolutely. of prior machines. For me, There's I an think... earlier author who did similar things. And there's, right. there's another uh, slide here that shows this terrifying side <laughs> right, right, chariot yeah. with the, with the I don't know, you can uh, see awful. there's like chopped up bodies. Right, you know, right. The... But what's so spectacular about the Leonardo ideas is that they are elegantly efficient that if you're going to go after somebody in war, why not slice them neatly the first right. time rather than having to go right. uh, back and forth? If you're going to have cannon and you're going to try uh, to, to bring an end to these incessant wars, I mean, Italy from the Middle Ages on, which was battles between cities to then the great invasions in Michelangelo and Leonardo's time to certainly during the uh, rest of the 16th century just is endlessly at war. And I think we might, one of the ways we might look at these machines is to think of Leonardo as saying, okay, how we're going to have to deal with this as a reality, but maybe this is the atom bomb. Maybe this is, are some of the kinds of machines that could bring victory to one side and keep uh, and bring some of this conflict uh, to an end. But to me, is also very, uh, Gary, he has, uh, he has already mentioned the name of this uh, humanist, Roberto Valturio, born in Rimini. And uh, he, he published in 1472, De Re Militari, right. which is, uh, that was uh, in Latin, 1472. Then in 1483, that is just before, probably, 
the, the time of those paintings. This was published very successfully in Volgare, in the vulgar language, so that everybody could read. So uh, it's true, if you look at those, and Valturio, he illustrated and described the machines in use among the Romans. Mm -hmm. So it was an antiquarian. Romans uh, way back when. Ancient Romans, uh, ancient Romans. Okay. Romans uh, the, the ancient Romans. So this was a sort of antiquarian dream. It was, uh, it was something uh, in the key of the humanist mind, of course. And I see those machines like, uh, you know, fantasy dreams, uh, beautiful illustrations, but not really. Yeah, I'll uh, disagree with able. you on that. I do, I do think that there is some sense that he's trying to make, as I've said, the war more efficient, that there would be some of these things. Yeah, they're outrageous. They're, they're <laughs> contraptions. But many of the things he's got, uh, figure out how better to have a, a wall that cannot be seized because it pushes yes, yes, the uh, uh, siege people forward. Or, or he's with got lever, uh, various right? uh, machines that are going to use this new cannon technology in an even more uh, spectacular way. And He's figuring out how, how might I cast them, but even more, how might I put them in multiples together? That doesn't, in the end, answer your question, how does this seemingly elegant and relatively pacifistic and uh, uh, perhaps vegetarian person deal with this, uh, other than I think that uh, this was where you made your money. Uh, and uh, uh, it, there was a lot more uh, money in the arms business, certainly, than in the painting. Can I say just a little note? Leonardo himself writes that those uh, cars, uh, mm. chariots, they, they were often more dangerous to those who used them right. than That's to true, true. those That's who were supposed yeah. to be offended. And plus, as you can see, he invented the flying saucer. Um, <laughs> now, so we, we have to take questions now. Uh, and, but, and so please stand up so I can see you. The lights are kind of bright. There's a question right here in front. Do we have a microphone? Yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Simonetta Brandolini from Friends of Florence. Uh, I wanted to just clarify a few things uh, you went over fairly quickly hey. about the uh, research that was done on the wall sure. in the Sala del Cinquecento. Well, first of all, I, I want to thank, we have a donor here actually, Bob Crane, who donated towards um, research. We did actual archival research to see how that wall was built by Vasari. Right and what it was made of, and if there was a possibility of having a, a, a vacuum space behind it. And what came out from the archives, and it was about a year's worth of, uh, of research, if not more, uh, that the bricks were actually made, counted, and made in a width that allowed a fairly large space behind that would protect the wall of, of uh, Leonardo. So that was actually something that was written, it was documented, it came out, and then about all the political, uh, this isn't a question, it was just a clarification, really. <laughs> but all the political uh, essence of what happened afterwards was completely clear because Renzi was the mayor of Florence, uh, the opposition to him was in Rome, and uh, National Geographic just got really tired and said, we're not gonna fund this anymore, and so it closed <laughs> down. Uh, but that there, they, they did find some traces of lead paint when they were doing all of the probing. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was, there is a chance that there's something there. Even if they took down the wall, would they ever find anything? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Okay, thanks no, for I that. I just wanted to clarify no, that uh, there were some more very true. Thank you, Simonetta. No, uh, it's, it's actually very true. I believe that uh, something uh, may, be find, may be found behind the wall. I, I'm pretty much sure. But you know, you know very well the, the political situation in Florence. Renzi in his ascent, uh, I remember when he was Presidente della Provincia, county, he wanted to make uh, a new facade. He wanted to give a new facade to the Church of San Lorenzo, for example. <laughs> and, you know, a couple of days later, he had to, to give up because he was assaulted, you know, by everybody. So, so and when it was, was the time of the Battaglia d'Angari, he was very much pro it. Because, uh, first of all, he's, uh, he's a generous guy. He believes very much uh, in innovation. So uh, he's, uh, he's that way. But he has his own enemies. And many of his enemies were in the Soprintendenza, which is the other protagonist mm -hmm. in Florence. Soprintendenza, which after the first uh, 
who knows if there will be others, uh, government uh, Renzi, the Sovrintendenza has been eliminated, does not exist anymore. Maybe also as a consequence of this, the director of the Uffizi Gallery is now a German. You know, the Sovrintendenza that was a casta does not exist anymore, or it's, uh, it's something completely it's different, different than it was. But, you know, I have here, I, I have here a letter. Uh, when I know that in 2011, Renzi wrote a letter to the minister Ornaghi, this was the minister at the time of the governo Monti, saying, I will do this when there will be a new government. He said that. But the most important thing of all, this is something that you must learn because this is Italy. What happened is that 35 scholars, some of their names are tremendously important. I'll put above all Salvatore Settis. And then you have uh, my friends, a performer of friends, Cagliotti, Pinelli, mm, not to, uh, but there was also Kit Christiansen of the Metropolitan. I don't know if he's still there. But anyhow, they wrote a letter saying that uh, this search should be interrupted right away. And some, including Settis and Montanari, I called them Savonarola people. I mean, they are people that you can't even plant a nail in the wall. Uh, it's a crime. They would say, this, is, this violates our constitution. They call the constitution. Yeah, yeah. So this violates the constitution. So 35 scholars wrote this letter and uh, uh, Alessandra Mottola Molfino, the president of like what you have here, the historical society, you know, she sent uh, a letter to the magistrates uh, asking to investigate if there was a crime mm -hmm. in that search. So everything had to be interrupted. So when I tell you that uh, behind uh, the wall, uh, there's more politics than Leonardo. Right. Yeah. I'm serious. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a very <laughs> simple situation. We have a question right here. So, yes. Um, uh, can you put up the slide of the, uh, of the uh, battle scene, please? Sure. I'd like you to help decode the image. Ah, OK. So you want this slide? That's no. really hard. Let's just go look at that. The No. That one? No. The Vasari. OK. Yep, yep. I'm sorry. Coming up. There we go. That's one. All right. Uh, it's clear that you spent a lot of time on that green flag way in the back. Right. We, they, they, clearly, the enemy must be on the left side of the picture. Every soldier is facing their arms in this direction. Right. And then when you look at the bottom, there are three apparently soldiers are really being massacred. Mm -hmm. They certainly cannot be the enemy. What are they? Traitors? Are they p soldiers that were ready to desert? Please explain the mayhem that's going down at the bottom. Go ahead, Gary. Uh, um, um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, aren't, the, aren't, I mean, they, aren't those just the enemy they've it, been overrun? Usually you will have in the front of these paintings um, the, the trampled uh, enemy, in, indeed, and that may be who's represented here. Uh, it is a uh, wonderful... Uh, embarrassing fact of being a Renaissance art historian that when you get to Vasari, you stop looking. Uh, and it's, and it, it shouldn't be. Uh, there are now many younger scholars who are looking much more seriously, are trying to understand what it is. But we were told as students, and I'm afraid I may have told many of my students, oh, that's just Vasari. Uh, let's keep on going. We always say that. that yes. We always say Martin, that. You, who are Vazari? Martin has a question. Yeah, uh, yeah Martin Kemp. Um, let's just think about one or two of the things in, in this in a kind of sober way and think what the probabilities are. The first is if we accept that the search is going place in the right wall, which right, is, we don't know, which is by no means definite, no. but let's assume it is. And we've discovered this brick lining wall. Now, Vasari had to do an enormous amount of straightening up what was a rather jerry built room. 
and you can look at the plans and see how he squared off one end of it, which was originally diagonal. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of rebuilding going on there, which necessitated uh, getting the room in a really good tidy state to receive all the Medician frescoes. Now, if there's a lining wall there of brick and there's a space behind it, which the investigations suggest, you would then expect to see a fine plaster in Tonico, which Leonardo painted on. We know he used Volterra plaster on that wall, which was a mixture of normal plaster with, uh, with marble. So a very highly finished uh, surface. You need to have that plaster surface there. What we've seen so far is rubble. There is nothing which suggests there is a smooth surface on which to paint. You need an intonaco, uh, Volterra plaster. You need uh, white lead priming, which he was going to do for his oil painting. So there's not, none of that has been discovered in that gap. At the moment, it's a messy gap, mm. and it's full of rubble. Um, the fact a pigment comes up is almost irrelevant because the idea that the council hall had no other paintings on the wall heraldic motifs, Florentine stripes or something, shields, and so on, is a nonsense. They wouldn't have left the wall unplastered and unpainted. So uh, that, that, to me, suggests that the data we've got so far isn't encouraging um, in that respect. And the other thing which is discouraging, we know what frescoes look like when people have painted Arseco. Fresco, as you know, is painted in wet plaster. If you paint on top of it, you paint Arseco dry, and that comes off. And you look at the Pisanello frescoes in, in, in Mantua, and there was a whole lot of Arseco painting that Pisanello did for the armor, the silver and so on. He painted all the flesh tones in one fresco, true fresco. A lot of it was painted not in fresco. That was covered over, and there is nothing left of the Arseco painting. It's all in little scraps on the floor. And I think even if this was the right wall, what we would find technically with this Arseco painting in oil paint on a wall with no damp, damp course, uh, with uh, uh, atmosphere changing all the time in Florence, high temperatures, high humidity a, a lot of the time, the idea that an oil painting is going to survive on this plaster already deteriorated under these circumstances, I think is close to zero. Thank you. Um, another question, we have two more minutes. Way in the back, we have some questions. No, the Cercatrova inscription, by the way, looks as if it's painted on top of the cracks. Yeah. In the way in the back here, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, Paula Crown. Um, I work with uh, a fabricator and also high-tech scanning uh, company called Factum Arte. And they have done, um, replication of King Tut's tomb, and they have scanned the, the, the Last Supper uh, as well, uh, the front and back. Um, they've come to the point where this is non-invasive scanning. And in fact, at King Tut's tomb, they found uh, such detail that they think they found the tomb of Nefertiti. So um, I'm not quite sure. I, I'm understanding why there's so much concern about damaging uh, the surface when they can do all sorts of scientific uh, tests. So the question is, is there a, a technological, you know, quick way to go in and, find, and solve this mystery without damaging the Vasari or upsetting the, the whole political establishment? I'm not, not able to not, say. I'm not technically able to, to answer that, but our, if the will were there, yes, the scanning can do these remarkable things. We have a question over here on the left. Hi, I'm Bob Crane. Uh, actually, a comment on that. Um, Maurizio Saracini, I invite you all to Google, because there's a lot of information on this, actually started off wanting to use gamma radiation. Right. And uh, unfortunately, to be able to see what was behind there, the Palazzo Vecchio would have been... Um, radiated to the point that nobody can go in for 10,000 years. <laughs> so, uh, that wasn't going to be good. The, uh, the other point is on taking off of a sari, the, either the Supertenza or the Opificio, several years before, took off a hind quarter of one of those horses on the opposite wall to see if there was a painting behind it. So that, that can be done in, you know, after the flood and Napoleon took mm -hmm. frescoes off walls. So that's, that's easily done. 
Well, there is the, the I mean, it became, was very popular and, and necessary right after the Florence flood of 66 to uh, take frescoes off walls and they were, some of them were rolled up with, with uh, through glue and others were removed. There now is a, a sense that, that those frescoes are damaged when it's done insofar as there are hairline cracks that the works never quite look the same. But is it possible in a sense to, to have uh, carved the Vasari painting off of its background, get it in there, yes, and put it on another support. Getting that brick wall, that would, would probably be possible in terms of a, a re reconstruction. Uh, it will have to await the, the people who really want to uh, either have it happen or not. Question in the back. Um, I just wanted to go back to a possible answer to your earlier question about who's in the front. I've heard one military right. historian argue that it's Filippo Strozzi the Younger who was the leader of the Fioraciti. And also Vasari's sort of distortion of the battle is evident in the depiction of the Turks who are shown sort of half naked when in fact um, they were very, very sophisticated. That was the time of Suleiman the Magnificent. No, that's helpful. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you. Another question, uh, real quick. We're about to wrap up here. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's call it uh, quits there. This was really fascinating. Thank you for being here. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you, Maurizio. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.